Athlete Podcast. Coach Neil, thank you so much for coming on the show today, brother. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Okay. So I have a ton that I want to talk to you about. And and I think this is like the first, I don't know, Joel, you from, correct me if I'm wrong. This might be the first person, well, maybe John Cerritos that we've, we've had like a kind of a personal relationship with before we get on, right? So I get to speak to you darn near every day uh, in the wrestling room at Poway. But it's a little bit of a different dynamic when you're on mic and when you're on. So, so I'm going to ask you some questions today that maybe I, I probably should ask you more often, you know, when we see each other in restrooms, I, I take for granted the fact that I've got Steve Neal next to me in the wrestling room every day. And for those, and, and I know you don't like talking about this stuff, but it's gotta be Bo Dion and then Steve hmm. Neal, as far as two sport athletes, right? As far as multi sport athletes, it, I, I don't know if people realize like there's a couple other people in the world's history that have done things that you have done. So, growing up was was that ever something on your was it was it ever on your mind that you could play professional football? Was it ever on your mind that you could win a world title when you were growing up? Uh, you know, I. I... I dreamed about playing football in the NFL. Didn't even know about wrestling until ninth grade. But when I didn't have the opportunity to play football in college and wrestling was my gateway to an education, I just dove into wrestling and wanted to take as far as I could go. So, yeah. you know, once I had the wrestling thing going, it was like, how good can I get? And I worked really hard. And then world championships, Olympic champion, all that stuff was kind of on the radar after, after the fact. But, uh, without even with that, like just by happenstance, because like, that's how uh, this is what's paying. This is my meal ticket right now. Um, but at what point did you go, Oh, I could, I could do this at a real, as far as wrestling goes. Oh, I could do this at a really high level. Well, yeah. So I, I think my f senior year in high school, I took fourth in high school state. And then I wrestled uh freestyle state at 220 pounds and I won that. And I'm like, I, there's no reason why I can't win junior nationals. And so I showed up at junior nationals at 220 and I won that. And right then it's like, I can win these tournaments because I didn't have a lot of skill. I just, I've always been a strategy kind of guy. And then you have enough, you know, how, where's the weakness of this opponent? Where's their strength? How can I maneuver to trick this, not trick the guy, but right. how but can I get to my positions? How can I get? the path of victory, where is that, what does that look like and how can I get there? So I, I knew I could probably compete against a lot of guys that were better than me. Um, if I just stayed on, on that kind of track. Yeah. Okay. But one of the things that we tried to focus on in this, on, on this podcast is processes, right? Like hyper successful people have processes for certain things, right? What was your process like when you were scouting an opponent or was it on the fly? Like, oh crap, I had better, I better check this box, this box, and this box. I better get my left leg back a little further. What was your strategy like when you were, when you were scouting an opponent? Um, I don't want to say it's on the fly, but I think the way I approach things are completely different than anyone else. Uh, I grew up playing sports, had two brothers. I grew up watching sports. Um, we played basketball all the time. And it's like, if this guy's faster than me, I got to kind of bang into him. I got to make him feel, you know, maybe he doesn't like to get hit. Like you got to figure out a little way. So when I'd scout someone for wrestling, it's like, okay, is this guy strong? Is this guy fast? Is it, So it wasn't more the moves. It was like, what kind of an athlete is this guy? And how can I use my athleticism to beat him? And so I get a quick guy. Okay, I'm going to bang him as hard as I can. I'm going to try to be strong and slow him down. If the guy's really slow, I got to move. You know, so it wasn't more of like a technical no. move to move, right leg, left leg, finger, fingernail, yeah. you know, a chow, you know, yeah. with Kung Fu Panda. You know? <laughs> it was more of just like, I'm going to see what positions I can succeed in and how can I get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah the cubans do a very good job of that okay is he stronger than me or is he faster than me is he right-handed is he left-handed overall broad strokes is probably the way to do it 
when you not not on the fly right but like when you're looking at somebody that was stronger than you how how did you as a a, a very mobile heavyweight how did you go about neutralizing strength like that was it just stay on the outside because you don't always have that choice right like he, he, you have to engage at a certain point or was it what were you were you just trying to open up a leg attack what was your idea if somebody was a lot stronger than you uh if they're a lot stronger than me uh which i used to wrestle tom erickson who was way stronger <laughs> is you got to think that strength won't be as strong in the last minute or two okay but it'll be that strong if you don't do anything and you just stand still that that strength will last so you know, as a boxer, you, you go walk in there, you know, and he reaches for your head and you're ducking it and you're just always moving and then you move side to side and circle and, you know, bang them, get back, just try to in and out side to side. And then as soon as you can take a leg attack, you got to get in and get up. You can't just shoot in and stop. You know, that's, that's not good, but just, just mm -hmm. constant movement, constant, um, you, know, you know, up and down side to side, trying to create angles. And then when you go, like you're going and uh, yeah. it, it, it didn't work early with Erickson because he was, I mean, he was a straight up man and I was a 220 pound, you know, young man. Yeah. And then finally, I think I turned 23 or 24 and I got bigger and then it's like, okay, I can, I can handle that strength. But uh, yeah, when you're wrestling someone strong, you try to go toe to toe. Like, you know, we talk about it in the, in our room with, we have a high level Greco guy in, uh, in Kikanu. And yeah. it's like these high school kids walk in and get an over under. And it's like, are you guys like get on your knee, you know, <laughs> wrestle like this. Don't let them get an underhook. You're going to go get tossed. So, yeah, you know, it, it's funny, man. And, and I, I'm not saying I never thought about this, but I certainly it is far closer to the forefront of my mind after having spent the last two years with you in the room. You always tell these kids wrestle where you're good. Now I know that that is a really broad statement and it's very easy to say, Oh, just yeah, go to the positions that you're good. No, 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 no. You have to find yourself in those positions as much as possible. Like you have to wrestle to those positions as much as possible. Now, you said you kind of grew up strategizing all sports. Was that something that was just, second nature to you to, to find okay this is how i get to my position in wrestling was that something that you just came to you easy um well i think the thing that came to me easy is i hate to lose so it doesn't matter what it is i hate losing so whatever strategy i can have for monopoly or like there's you can have a strategy and you try it and it, you lose all the time like throw that in the trash let's try something different so mm -hmm. for me like basketball I wasn't the greatest shooter, but I could dribble fairly well. And I had no problem with physicality. So I would dribble in as hard as I could. I jump up super high. And if that shot's there, I'll take it. But if there's three guys collapsing on me, I'm going to just dish it to one of my teammates and they should be wide open, you know? And then you do that for a while. And then you just try to figure out how can I have the advantage with the players I have around me. And, and so I, I love, you know, I love watching boxing and it's like, this guy's super fast, but this guy's super tough. He's going to get him in the corner. I mean, there's every, you know, tennis, this guy can return it, you know, but this guy has great shots, you know, uh, this, who is it, Nadal and uh, Federer for years, Nadal will just not stop returning the thing over. And if Federer hits it and gets it out of bounds, Nadal wins, you know, so mm. like watching sports, trying to understand like what, what are these people trying to do? And football is a great sport. I mean, you got the play action pass, you're running down the, you know, you got a screens, you got draws, you have all these things to try to just kind of set the defense up and then trick them, you know? And so I, I, I just love watching sports and, um, and I, I really try to use those attributes into whatever sport I was doing uh, just to try to give me the edge. Cause like I said, I hate losing. And so at the end mm -hmm. of the day, I just hate losing. And that's the bottom line. Something tells me, and I, I hope that you'll elaborate on this. Something tells me that not only your, hatred for losing but also your mind for sports was probably something that attracted coach belichick to you um am i crazy for saying that it, it seems like he's an absolute strategist yeah, yeah um he he saw that i had the ability um and i had the hunger 
So I think you get in there and it's like, why are these people playing football? And I would think maybe 50%, maybe it's only 10%, but maybe there's quite a big percent of people are playing just because they want to get paid money. Mm. Uh, money is great, but I want to win. And so I think when you as a GM or a head coach, you interview these guys and you ask them, like, you can kind of tell right away, like this guy does not like to lose. You, you, you bring back a game and, you know, their, their, their head hangs low and, uh, you know, they don't want to talk about that, but they will. Where other guys are like, oh, man, I had great stats that game. And it's like, but the team lost. Like, what is that? You know, I mean, like, well, I think we talked about at Buchanan. We lose that duel. Like, I, you feel bad for the Lairds because he got a pin. Like, there's nothing more I could have done. Yeah. We lost a duel. Like, that, that's the attitude where you lose a duel and this one guy's smiling. Well, yeah. I got a pin. It's like, dude, you don't understand. Yeah. You know? So, I think th those are the type of things that Belichick looked for and had a lot of success um, back in – for about 20 year period yeah here, here's the thing that we didn't lose the duel okay just so we're clear no we won't yeah exactly so <laughs> but 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 that said though i don't think any one of us walked into that wrestling room i don't think any of us walked into the monday center on that monday no pun intended um and we're happy and stoked and i think we were all relieved um the, I, I I think you and I spoke about it. There was there were some things that we could have done a lot better for sure as a team. Um, when you didn't have the results that you wanted, and even got a win, right? We we walked away with a W. It wasn't pretty, but we walked away with a W. That said, when you were competing, whether it be in football or wrestling, and you didn't get the results that you wanted, you. I can't imagine that you would always just throw away a complete strategy. Um, but how did you go about going back to the drawing board on like uh, a McCoy, right? Who who gave you fits because he was just, you know, he got his head and his hands in the way and he wasn't giving up that double leg. How did you go back to the drawing board um, as an athlete? Um, well, I think it's 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 easy to go back when you lose, uh, but true champions, when they win, they can go back and try to like, make things better. And I was very fortunate to have good coaching up there at Bakersfield and good workout partners. And what I think is crazy is like there's so many times there's certain situations you get into and you, you, your success rate in that situation might be 60 percent. And to me, I don't think 60 percent is high enough. You want to take these positions like, man, I'm scoring. 90% of the time when I get here. And if you're losing in positions, then you, you got to for sure not get there, but then you got to try to work on how can I make this a stalemate at, at the worst, you know? And so I think I did a really good job of identifying the situations I, I, I could have a, a high percentage uh, chance. And then if in matches, I hit this shot and I get stuck in this position and we're in the shin wizard position, whatever it is, I would go back and I would work on that position. Like I'd start there and then really try to work through it with my partners. And then once you get through that in the situations, then in matches, like, or not matches, but the, the practice matches that you have, mm. I would throw myself into those situations instead of just hitting easy. Wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, I got to stop you there. I'm sorry. Yeah. You would throw yourself into the positions that you stink at or the positions that you're 60% at? That I'm working on. Okay. So, I mean, there, there's, it is value. There is value to put yourself in positions you're not good at to figure mm -hmm. it out. But when I'm trying to improve throughout the season, I think the off season, is a good time to work on those weaknesses. Uh, during the season is a good time to try to, to improve on the positions you get stuck. And then when you're competing, you got to hide, <laughs> absolutely hide from those positions you're going to fail at. Cause you already know what's going to happen. Unless the guy just doesn't know that position, you get lucky. And I don't yeah. want to be, lucky. I want to be, in a position I know I can succeed. How would you decide I'm 60% and now I've worked on this and now I'm 90%? Like, what is what does that feel like to you to to have that confidence within a specific position? Well, yes, yeah, having all the, the failure that I had in high school, I mean, I, I lost a lot of matches and I really, I mean, I was able to improve quite a bit. Um, I always have a tally in my head. I mean, like I said, I hate losing. So I, there's a tally in my head of how many, you know, this guy took me down this many times today. 
this guy, you know, I, I got only got two takedowns the entire day. And, and when I was in college, I mean, it was, you go like a week without getting a takedown. So for me, I'm not thinking about, oh, I had a good practice today. I got a good sweat. Like I'm thinking, holy cow, I, I, I owe this guy. I owe this guy. I, owe, you know, no one owed me early. And <laughs> so like I, like I said, I'm competitive. I think we all are. Um, and I, I, I can't turn that off. So it's really easy for me to, to keep stats. It's like, okay, all right. I know where I'm at. Um, and then you start realizing, okay, I can get this guy here. I can get that guy there. And so during practice, my mind was thinking all the time. I wasn't just showing up and sweating, which I think a lot of kids, that's what they do. They just come to practice. Coach said to wrestle. I'm just going to wrestle. I'm not, not this guy. I'm over here. I'm keeping score on everything. Um, but I'm not afraid to get taken down, trying something new. I think that's sure. another thing you don't want to do, like just not wrestle because you're trying to – to win one zero, that's probably the worst thing you can do in practice. Yeah, I I think that's one of the worst things you can do. Because if we're going to be honest, right, ninety percent of our wrestling season is practice, right? Like, I mean, it's like, so how did how do you and maybe how, how do you talk about this with the kids, like? on a one-on-one type of scenario about competing hard in the practice room and in those extensions of the practice room. Cause that's really what a lot of these, these tournaments are. Um, we got a couple that we schedule, right. That we, that we kind of circle on the schedule, like the doc bees, like that's a, that's a banger dude. And, and, you know, it's important that you perform well for your future there, uh, the state tournament, obviously, but, but, you know, when we go to Del Norte, it's just an extension of the practice room. Um, how do you convey to these young athletes now that you're in a coach's role that you have to be competitive, but you also have to try new things and you have to get better and you have to progress? Because that's a it's a it's a hard thing for a kid to hear, right? Like, yeah, go win. Don't you know? Don't goof this up, but try new things. Yeah, that, that is tough. I, I really think this year we have done something. We've talked about this quite a bit, but I think we've done something quite special. Um, from the first tournament on, it's like, hey, guys, you need to get four takedowns in the first period. Then you can think about pinning them. And I mm -hmm. think allowing those kids to experience all those different uh, positions and the different shots that they're taking, mm -hmm. they gain confidence. Sure. And then they, they get that, that, uh, that pace that Shannon is always talking about. He's like every 30 seconds, you should at least have one or two shots. So they're getting that pace. They're getting these situations and then they're just becoming hammers. And we're seeing that towards the end of the year at uh, CIF. And I know it's not the toughest tournament for San Diego. Uh, we had 14 in the finals and 42 matches to get there. 40 were pins. I mean, that is, that's unheard of. And that's really cool because it's, it's something that as a coaching staff, we all really focused on, like, listen, it's not okay just to beat this guy. We got to beat him down. Yeah. And so even leaving that tournament, there's things to work on. Hey, we can do this. We can do that to get better. Um, but I think it's, it's really fun talking to these kids and, and, and letting them understand that, yeah, it's cool to win, but we want you to improve. And mm -hmm. I think they're all doing a really good job. I mean, when you're, when your backup team is beating teams by 200 points, in the tournaments that's unbelievable and i'm so happy for our kids yeah there's no question um i was looking i went back and look at looked at cif stats and we weren't in the top three for points scored and my wife's like how is that even possible i'm like because we pinned everyone <laughs> she, she's got, like she's like you know she's competitive she's probably the most competitive one in this house and she was ready to flip a table because we weren't first in that stat specific. <laughs> I'm like, wait, Hey, cool out. We got first period pins. We were spending, we were spending time getting off the mat. That's what we were doing. So yeah, you're, you're right. And, and, and I think that there is, a, there is some good, really good stuff going on in Poway's room right now. And, and the extension of the room, which is some of these events. Um, one of the cool coolest things that i saw and i'm sure and i, I think we, you and i have actually spoken about it but they're competing 
with themselves, Mm -hmm. right? Like it's not like, I remember when, when not the Penn state's not great right now, because this might be the best freaking you know, college wrestling team in history. Um, Cause they have seven legitimately seven guys that can win a national title, which is bananas, but okay, whatever. Um, but when it was uh, Zane and, and Nolf and Chenzo and Bo Nickel and like those guys, the other, the opponents almost didn't matter. Like, it was like, they were like, hey, Zane, watch this. I know you got out there and got a first period pin, but watch this, you know, and they would, they would compete with one another. And when you start doing that, now it's special. Now, what I guess I said all that to say this in your world, whether it be football or whether it be wrestling, I'm more curious to to hear about the football side of things because there's you got you were part of some of the greatest football teams of all time what does that look like how do you compete with one another on the same team in football is it in the practice room or you know is it you know what uh it's really hard because there's so many people in different positions Mm -hmm. but how you compete is like time spent so you'd, you'd show up it was funny we had we had great i mean you have mike vrabel rodney harrison teddy bruski you got Brady and I could just, I could go just keep naming guys, but um, I show up and I would go in the, in the, in the weight room and it's like six 45 and Rodney Harrison comes up. He's like, Hey, Hey Neil, good afternoon. Like, cause he's been there earlier, you know? So we're, you're on the, you're on the plane and you know, how many waters have you drank? How hydrated are you? So, I mean, these little details that are just kind of like, Oh, you know, these are cool things to do. You're competing. Like how hydrated are you? How, mm-hmm. how much, uh, have you, how much have you done in the training room to get ready for this? You know, so no matter what aspect, if you're hurt, how are you helping the team? How are you working hard to get back to where you, you, the best place you could be to compete? And so we had, we had, uh, quite a few years of that. And I mean, it crossed the board, Larry Izzo. I mean, he's, he's special team guy. You got the defense, you got the offense. And it's just, we had a really fun, uh, group of guys that, all times a day, you know, we're just in there kind of comp- not, not even competing in football, but just uh, we used to have the uh, kettlebells. I think they were 44 kilo kettlebells. Mm-hmm. Pretty that's, heavy. That's big. That's hundred pounds. They, had, they were like really thick. So you couldn't like, you know, wrap around. And so <laughs> we'd have days. It's like, all right, who can carry this the long farmer? So we'd farmers walk around the locker room and as a wrestler, I had a pretty good advantage. And so I could always beat everybody, but then it's like, well, who can get second place? Because Neil don't count; he's a wrestler. And so we're just over there, and your for- like your hands are just falling apart, and forearms on fire. But it's like we just, you know, compete in dumb stuff like that, and you get camaraderie. And to go back to CIF, uh, that was the competition: who can get the fastest pin. Mm-hmm. And so we're all talking about it beforehand. And then uh, I think. Uh, Edwin got 24 and then Elias got 17 and then Farha got seven and they're like heavyweights don't count but it was, more, <laughs> it was it was more on the referees like some of them are so green. slow <laughs> they get down there and they're like uh, is it a-? I mean these kids are pinning them in five six seconds but they're just not getting the calls <laughs> so it was kind of fun how they're competing and then it's like well who can get the most pins you know so uh, I really like what those guys are doing and, and uh, they're going to continue to do it this next couple of weeks, I think. And that'll put us in good position for this. Yeah, game. there's, there's no question. All right. I want to, um, I want to shift gears slightly. Um, when you were competing in wrestling, it was 120 kilos, correct? Something like that. 130, 130 kilos. So you had to keep yourself somewhere in and around 100, 275 pounds, correct? 286. 286. Okay. All right. I never had an issue. No, I didn't think you would. But when you get to the NFL, they want you over three on that line. That's not as easy as people think. What was your caloric intake like when you were pushing 300 pounds 
I have no idea. I never added it up. But the good thing about football is they have food nonstop the entire day at the facility. So, for instance, you go in in the morning and you go in at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. in the morning for treatment. Uh, you can walk in there and they have like just coolers full of Ensure, Gatorade, juices, milk. I mean, then they have an omelet bar. Then they have hot breakfast. I mean, it was just like nonstop. Then like a couple hours after that, they have morning snack and then there's lunch and there's afternoon snack one. <laughs> afternoon snack. I mean, it was just like there's and there's always like cold cuts so you can make a sandwich at any time. And then there was a dinner at, when you're leaving. And then they had a coach's dinner if you stayed later. And the coach's dinner, they'd have like the king crab legs and the steaks. And it was, it was real easy to, to, to keep, keep that weight on, you know. Um, yeah. but one thing I did to keep my weight on early is I stop running as much because as a wrestler, you're always running because you, you don't want to get tired and have everyone see that in the third period or late in the match. And so I, I stopped doing all those like two, three, five mile runs that I would do all the time. And then that helped me kind of keep the weight up a little bit. So interestingly, Gunner, your son, we're looking to get him up in weight and you're trying to explain to him, no, you can't not eat you always have to be eating and do you think it's you know it's because it's not as easy as as people think to gain weight you know when you're especially as a high level athlete what would you what do you say to gunner to to like hey man this is a job like you gotta you gotta eat eat well he had a breakthrough yesterday he waited 170 after oh. practice um but one thing he did yesterday morning was he got up at 3 30 in the morning and he got 16 ounces of water, like a cup of water, and then put a protein, a scoop of protein powder and like a third of a cup of oatmeal in there. So he drinks that, you know, and it's, you know, I got up with him yesterday, today did it on his own. And it's, it's tough to drink, you know, drink that in the morning, you drink it, go back to bed and then you get up and then you eat breakfast. And uh, we got a whole bunch of different bars that my wife and I went to Costco business to get a bunch of different <laughs> high caloric snacks. Um, but I think he finally understands. But the problem you have too, if you're just eating all that food and you're not doing the workouts, like you need to break your muscles down, right? Lift and push up. You know, you gotta you gotta get your muscle fibers broken down so they can heal back and get stronger. So I think he gets it. We'll see if he can be consistent. We'll see. Yeah, you know, I I kind of wanted to to talk about Gunner a little bit. You know, uh, it's one thing being a high level athlete in two different sports. It's another thing to be the son of a high level athlete from two different sports. Do you think that he feels any pressure um, to perform or pressure to compete in a certain way? Um, I would hope not. Um, it's never been about him winning or losing. It's about him doing his best. Um, but it, you know, in his little gunner brain, I don't, I don't know what's firing. Um but I, I tell him all the time that you you have you have more success you've had you're having more success in these years of your life than I did in mine as far as wrestling goes. Mm -hmm. The one thing that probably sets me and him apart is we grew up in a different era, and I know we've talked about this before. We were outside all the time, so yeah. I'm playing football. I'm I'm running. I used to love climbing trees. Not a good thing with no shoulders anymore. Uh, <laughs> called fall out of trees, um, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I used to love doing things and they would get it got me so strong just naturally by because I didn't lift weights until I got to college. I just didn't. I mean, that's not something that we did in our high school. So um, like I said, I, I think he's good where he's at. I hope he doesn't feel a lot of pressure to be successful because just go out there and do your best. And I love coaching him because I know what he can do and I know what he can't do and try to get him in those positions to be successful. And I was super proud of him this year. He won his last match in every tournament except for the one, the Battle of the Belt. He took second. Mm -hmm. But that's something that's really important to me is you win your last match. So whether you take seventh, fifth, yeah, or first, third. you mm -hmm. win your last match. That's a tough guy right there. Yeah, for sure. Um, who's – you have you uh, – people uh, – for people that don't know, you have two daughters playing Division One volleyball, one at uh, – Arizona State won at Oregon. Um, who's the most competitive out of the three? And and why do you think that is? Um, 
be honest, I don't think any of them are super competitive. I think my oldest is a. I think your bar is fairly high, but That's okay. Probably true. That's probably true. Um, <laughs> my oldest, she's like a perfectionist, so if she can't do it right. She doesn't want to do it at all. So mm. like the pickleball, she's like, I can't hit this. I can't hit it with the racket, so she won't play. And it's like, are you kidding me? You just take it ten minutes, you'll be fine. But uh, yeah, so she's probably the 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 perfectionist aspect where she she really wants to do well. I mean, all the all the kids want to do well, but uh, yeah, I guess when when I'm looking at my myself as the bar, I don't think anyone gets as close. <laughs> I mean, because it, it was you know, I, growing up with two brothers, it, and it wasn't said like, hey, whoever wait, whoever loses doesn't get to eat, but that's what it felt like. Yeah, yeah, just that's that's what, yeah, that does put a different spin on yeah. things. I mean, that's it? how I felt. That was no, the truth, yeah, that's right. I understand. Um, uh, perspective from your upbringing because it, it wasn't just San Diego you spent some time other places too um how do you think wh where was it uh, there was a, a place you you went for a year or two where was that again uh the Philippines Philippines what were you doing there number one for people that don't know number two how did that change your perspective, if at all, when you came back to California? Um, yeah, so my parents, they uh, were short-term missionaries um, in the Philippines. So we went over there for two years. I grew up in a Christian household, Christian faith. And I think the, the Christian faith, for me, really helps my uh, athletic ideas and my athletic identity. Because in the Christian faith, it says that God created each one of us in his own image. So all of us are, we all, we are all created in God's image, which means we all have this something special inside of us. And also if we're creating his, his image and he sees us all the same, if you can accomplish something, I can accomplish something according to what the Bible says. And I believe the Bible. So it really comes down to, um, if I have a good plan and I work hard. If, if I have a good plan to, to whatever it is, and I work hard, if you could do it, I could probably do it. Now, there's some limitations when it comes to, you know, if you're five foot two, probably be hard to make the NFL. But probably. I mean, there's some things that five foot two you can accomplish that people that are six five can't accomplish, you know, sure. uh, maybe gymnastics or diving or horse jockey. I don't sure. around. I'm saying. So I think when you think about it that way, it, it really frees you up. And I think what handicaps a lot of people and what stops people from having success is when they start saying, well, he grew up over here. Well, she blah, blah, blah. As soon as you start making excuses, you kind of limit the power that you have to control your own situation. And so I, I learned by going to a third world country, man, we're, we're all the same people. And if you have a good plan, you work hard, you can accomplish so much. And if you fail, you go back and evaluate did I, was my plan good or did I not work hard enough? And then you, you know exactly where you need to kind of fit in. And if you don't understand setting a plan, then that's when you have coaches to come help and guide you and say, this is, I know you think you're really good at a headlock, but a headlock doesn't work here anymore. You know, that, that type of sure. stuff. So, um, sure. I think that my, my faith really helps me to have success because it's kind of just like, if you fail at the goal, why'd you fail? Okay. You didn't have a very good plan, but you worked worked hard. So I don't know. I try to keep everything simple because I'm not the smartest guy. So I'm smart enough to know that I there's that I got to keep it simple. <laughs> you know, you say that, but there is there's far more going on, and, and I understand that it's a, it's a humble way of being, and, and that's wonderful. But you have far more going on behind those eyes than most people might realize. Um, <clears throat> okay. Do you remember the the story you said you told over here at dinner one time about the backpack from the Philippines? Oh yeah. Can yeah. you can you can you tell people about that, please? Yeah. So I was in fifth grade. See, my older brother was sixth grade. My younger brother was fourth grade. And so uh, we got back from the Philippines. We had missed two years of school, and so we're trying to get enrolled in school districts. And so my uh, my mom was like, "Oh, there's this magnet program in Southeast San Diego. It teaches science and math." And it's really, it's really good. So my mom and dad signed us up for um, 
these schools are, I, I guess, and I'm not trying to dog any place, but it, they changed the, the name of the street to Martin Luther King Boulevard. So it's a different dynamic or different group of people down there. Mm. So first day of school, my mom gives us these backpacks from the Philippines, these wicker backpacks. And <laughs> wicker backpacks. You got, yeah, you got these three white kids going into <laughs> a, a, a you know, minority neighborhood wearing these wicker backpacks. It was just, it was, yeah. If you ain't getting your ass beat then. I don't know when you will. <laughs> and my mom wasn't trying to get us tougher, but she did. I don't know. Just... <laughs> she wasn't. She wasn't trying to get my ass beat, but she did. <laughs> oh man, yeah. It was. It was not good. Uh, yeah, everyone was was hating us. <laughs> that uh, tickles me every single time. Without the backpacks, they even worth what worse with. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I, I, there's a couple of things that I, I want to talk to you. Like, so we, at, at the end of every show do uh, a, a series of questions that we ask everyone and we, but I want to add to a couple of those. Okay. So I'm going to leave this question on the table and you take from it what you will. What was the greatest win you've ever had? Oh, man. There's a lot to think about. Uh, for, for I can say the greatest win I ever had um, as far as it relates to camaraderie and team, uh, it would probably be my freshman year. I'm, I'm wrestling in the Pac-12, Pac-10 championship back then. Coming from San Diego High School, I'd never won anything. Um, I win the match at heavyweights and then we win the PAC 10 championships. The bigger sort of never won the championship before. Um, the scene at that time was they were going to cut our program in 1996. And so winning that match, we win PAC 10 in Bakersfield while they're going to cut us. And then we go on to the next week to the nationals where we had nine field qualify and we took third as a team. Um, and that really kind of, Winning that match at the Pac-12, that kind of sparked everything, I think. So that might be probably the the greatest win. Um, that's that's a great one. Yeah. That is a great one. And people forget that, like, not too long ago. I mean, I guess it's been a while now, but Bakersfield was was getting trophies. They were getting trophies like that. That's you know, it's not terribly far away, but. They're, they're, they got to get back to that. Okay. Absolute worst loss of your life. Oh, worst loss. I know this one. Easy. <laughs> um, so we're wrestling Lock Haven in the Virginia Duels. And Lock Haven was tough. This back when Craig Colat was there. But we this is a 96 when we took third. Mm -hmm. uh, so first guy loses, next guy loses. You know, we just we're on this like path of everyone's losing. So it gets down to the head, the 90 pounder. He's the only guy that wins. And we had four all Americans that year. And so I'm wrestling this guy. I was like ranked 12th in the country. He's ranked 13th. And I'm like, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to freaking destroy him. I was like, so fired up. And so I go in there, I shoot. Next thing you know, I'm in a cradle on my back and get called for the pin. And I'm like, what the, and I was just so mad and angry and, and so I learned from that, like, okay, I got to be under control. And then unfortunately, we well, fortunately, we got to wrestle them at the end of the tournament for third and fourth for team. Uh -huh. We were losing by eight points, and they didn't put the heavyweight out there for me to get revenge. And uh -huh. Because of the 13 and 12 seed. Sure, sure, sure. There, like, I, I never got to avenge the loss. Um, That's, he, uh... yeah, I lost 10 times in college by far. That was the worst loss <laughs> in college and of all time. Just... <laughs> Just frustrating. All right. Now, this next question, we ask everyone, but I have a feeling that it is going to be extremely different coming out of your mouth. What is the greatest wrestling shoe of all time? Now, why is it going to be different coming out of Steve Neal's mouth? Because they don't make very many wrestling shoes that fit you. <laughs> uh, my favorite wrestling shoe of all time was the uh, International Lights. Oh, I think that's, we've gotten that a couple of times. Those are great shoes. Yeah. I, I think I have one pair and it's got some shoe goo on there and it's just, it, it ain't going to work, but 
the, the favorite one is the red, white, and blue ones. I wore those, I think, in the world championships. I had a pair of black and silver ones, but they fit my feet great and they were light. And, and Adidas had all those light shoes, but I was an ASICs guy. I wasn't allowed to wear uh, Adidas. So I had to find the lightest uh, shoe, and that was the International Lights for me. Yeah, that's that's good stuff. They, I think we've gotten that a few times, Joel. Yeah. First time with those specifically, but fair we enough. Do have a, fair we enough. do have a lot of ASICs. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Mount Rushmore of wrestling. So the criteria is simple. Four people, Americans only. You can use any other criteria that you'd like, but who is on your Mount Rushmore of wrestling? Uh, well, you got to have Kale Sanderson. You got mm -hmm. Gable. Mm -hmm. uh, I would do John Smith and mm -hmm. Bruce Baumgartner. Wow. That was, dude, you rattled them off. Like most people haul and hum over that stuff for like five minutes. You can't, you can't think about it, man. You just got to, you just got to gotta... jump off. You just got <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess so. You know, it's funny, man. But I like my picks though, because uh, the I do too. ones are Gable and Kale. Get those out of the way, and then mm -hmm. John Smith is there mm -hmm. and as a heavyweight. Bomb, what Bomb Runner did is amazing. The he didn't lose to American for like ever. Fifteen years, yeah, fourteen years. Like it, it was a long freaking time. He he was on. I think he, I think he made fifteen teams. Yeah, like, all together. Like that's fifteen, fifteen. Yeah. Like we're 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 trumpeting JB, and don't get me wrong, we should. But he's a, that's 10. <laughs> that's the one, the one thing I will say about Gable and uh, Kale is they could have helped wrestling if they would have kept continued to wrestle. And that was the mm. one thing it made my choice easy to go to wrestling because when I left wrestling, McCoy was the number one guy. I wasn't, mm. you know, when, when those guys left wrestling, they were still the number one guy probably in the world. And I know they want to focus on coaching, but you almost have a responsibility as a wrestler if you're the best guy in America, you, you, you go out there and represent. And that's mm. one thing like, I, I never had any regrets about that because there was someone else that mm. was there. Taking yeah. That McCoy, team. McCoy made the team in, in 2000, man. And four. Yeah, that's true, man. That, that gives me a lot to think. Of. Now, do you consider, do you think about, the way you left the sport or do you think about the way you leave you are your legacy in the sport at all like how, how often does that come up in your mind um no i i really my, my plan was to play football uh and then as soon as football was done they were done with me i was going to go back and wrestle unfortunately my body was just too beat up to do anything because mm -hmm. I, I thought that would be the one of the greatest story and rulon's done it a couple times where he's like yeah i'm going to wrestle in the olympic trials but like, I really wanted to wrestle in the Olympic trials and, and um, you know, give it a shot and maybe bring the, the football people have a story, you know, and that, sure. that type of deal. It just, my body just couldn't, couldn't do it. Did you even try, like, did, was it even like, all right, let me see if I can get down there. Well, no, well, cause I, I easily could have made, well, it was too sick. No, 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 no. I don't mean the weight. I'm saying like, let me get down in a stance. Let me grab a leg. Did you oh, even no. consider it? Oh, I used to go into Bakersfield and wrestle with the guy. Cause in the, there'd be the, off season was what while they were getting training for nationals. So after the mm -hmm. Super Bowl to nationals, so I used to go in there and wrestle with the guys getting ready for nationals. And um, you know, because we like I said, Bakersfield had, had some big guys and Coach Pope mm -hmm. was there, so I'd, I'd wrestle with those guys. Um, but think towards the end, two thousand nine or ten, I'm wrestling with some of the guys, and like I can't even. I'm just holding them with one arm, like this arm's just like flopping here. So mm -hmm. it's like there's no way I could have like my lower body. I could change levels. It's just this is my attack arm, my right arm, and I, I had nothing. So, mm. uh, in theory, I could try to be defensive, but I, I get bored being defensive. That's fair. Joe Shaw, you got anything else before we go, brother? Stephen Neal, a football player or a wrestler? Oh, man. Uh, early on, I would, I would have said football player 100%. And then even when I was wrestling, I'd say football player. And then now that I start playing football, it's like, nah, man, I'm a wrestler. Because, I mean, the bottom line is you can control so much on your own in wrestling. Football, you have to count on others. And without disrespect, I don't like to count on others. Um, I like to rely on myself. And um, and just the work ethic and the character of the people in the wrestling community is just such higher quality than the, the, the fake football world out there. So definitely a wrestler. 
But before you guys leave, I, got, I want to show you one thing. So tell me when you're about to be done. We're ready. Okay. You, anytime. You mentioned it. Okay. God, it's a ring. Here we go. What is that? Oh, is that a Bakersfield trophy? Oh, again, 1996. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Third place team. Man. What is it going to – okay. You're going to bring it up. What is it going to take to get a team like Bakersfield back to scoring enough points at the NCAA tournament to win a trophy? Because that ain't easy, man. That ain't easy. We're the only team in California history to ever do it. Uh, I think on the West Coast, Oregon State and Arizona State won. Oregon State has brought a trophy home. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if Boise had or not. They were mm -hmm. close. But first and foremost, we need to be funded by the school. Mm -hmm. So if you're not funded by the school and you have to community fundraise, no matter what, you cannot. Because any kid that goes to Cal Poly to get recruited or goes to anywhere, Cal Baptist, and they're saying, yeah, I'm thinking about Bakersfield. They're going to tell them, well, they're not even fully funded. You're going to have to spend time um, fundraising. You're going to have to do all kinds of events just to raise money. And they're, they're not wrong. And that's unfortunate yeah. because they're not making stories up. It's the truth. Yeah. And it's just if they fully fund the program and they commit to it, uh, I don't think there's – I mean, there's a lot of hard work that has to get involved. Sure. You can't take junior college kids and turn them into – you know, all of not in 2024. You can, it's yeah. real hard well, to do that. You can bring in some, cause that's one thing. If you're focused on trying to get guys to be all Americans, it's really hard to bring guys from the junior college level through. That's what junior colleges are for. Yeah. They get those guys to that level. Then you I think it's okay to plug some holes. No, with, for sure. With the Juco for kid, sure. But, but you can't have 10 kids that you only have for two years to develop. Like it just, I, it's, it's almost impossible. I meant recruiting kids that should go to junior college. That's what yeah. I mean by yeah, junior college kids. Like you can't. I was I was like, being nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know what you meant, coach. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's uh it's tough, and also they don't have a full staff. I mean, I think they just got a third coach. You know, mm -hmm. and it's community funded, like I said. So it's just it, it's been a tough road, and it's it it's hard to watch. No one, the, the history of that place, you know, you have Azevedo, Joe Gonzalez, uh, the Questus brothers, you know, Paul Keesaw. Um, Keesaw's at Fresno City. Is that he correct? Is, he is. Jesse and he does a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, there's some, there's some great names that wrestle for Bakersfield, man. It's, um, you're right. It's, it's not ideal, the situation. But again, I think a lot of the sport has changed where, I think in, in the nineties, early two thousands, there was just far less money floating around the sport. So it was easier to compete with the lock havens. Well, that's a bad example. Um, the Cal polys of the world, the, 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 it's just, there was less. So it was more of an equal playing field. Um, but man, when you're, when you're starting off with two to four scholarships and like, now you got to raise for everything else. It's it's an uphill battle, man. It's an uphill battle in 2024. That's we're, really we're starting with having to pay for coaches' salaries. That's what I mean. That's yeah. how bad it is at Bakersfield. Coaches' right. salaries, pay paying for all scholars. You know, so I mean, it's just paying for travel. I mean, it's it's brutal. We were raising two hundred fifty thousand dollars every single year. I mean, that's just to have a program, and they've helped out a little bit. But you need to go in there and say, okay, we got you guys, right. Yeah, understood. Okay, so that's step one. All right, last question, really quick. Not really quick. Here's a magic wand, and you could wave this magic wand and change one thing about the sport of wrestling. What would it be? One thing. Oh, man. I, I, I would think it'd be great to change, like, the skin infections don't matter anymore. But I don't think you could do that. Um, it's a magic wand, man. You can get rid of all funk with one magic wand. You'd do it. <laughs> that, that would be good. But I think I think the one thing that I think would be the best, and it might screw up all of wrestling, is just uh, if people valued the work and and people were rewarded financially for the hard work and the effort and the entertainment. I mean, 
and maybe that's two swipes of the wand. Like people. No, care. I get it. No, I, I no, I, I make it makes sense. But you see, like it, even the UFC is not where it should be compared to football. But like these football players, they they have tremendous skills, but a lot of them are just massive human beings, you know. And it's like you can't control if you're 140 pounds, but you can control that you're an absolute beast at 140 pounds, which a lot of these wrestlers are. And uh, the excitement that I get, the excitement that you guys get when you're watching wrestling, I wish all of America got that and our sport would just explode and grow. Yeah. That is aces. That is a great magic wand answer. I love that one. All right. Awesome. You're the best man. Coach, I will see you in a couple hours. Thank you very Sounds much good. for coming on and uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Sounds good. Guess have a good day. Welcome to the Ant of the Podcast. What did you want to know with the top guest? Right now with the project. What you want to know, man? What you want to know? Welcome to the Ant of the Podcast. What did you want to know with the top guest? Right now with the project. What you want to know, man? Welcome to the show.